Lakes and I think it may be it's a it's a very interesting country, Bhutan. Thank you, Thank you very much, oh. uh, Michaela. Okay, good morning everybody. It's 9.30 sharp. Uh, welcome to uh, this one of the first Stockholm Plus 50 side events called uh, Wellbeing Economies, a new economic approach for human and planetary health. Uh, 50 years ago, the Limits to Growth report warned us that exponential economic growth would have devastating consequences uh, for us and the planet. 50 years later, we're gathering here, and uh, the rapid expansion of an economic model that's based on resource extraction, labor exploitation, um, and the exploitation of nature has resulted in, um, well, vast inequalities and the destruction of the environment. So this moment now is critical um, for humanity to prevent that we're actually reaching um, um, tipping points in the Earth system. So the question is, um, how can we all live well within the ecological uh, limits of uh, the planet. I'm Patricia Heidegger, I'm from the European Environmental Bureau and I'm very excited uh, to discuss this question um, this morning with our distinguished panelists and our friends and our co-organizers. Um, it's a quite long list, uh, the Club of Rome, uh, WWF International, Swedish Society for Nature Conservation, the Wellbeing Economy Alliance, International Cooperatives Alliance, Global Call for Action Against Poverty, Trust Africa and uh, Ebon International with the support of the uh, Future Generations Commission of Wales, the European uh, Commission, the Commission is hopefully joining us in a moment, um, the governments of Finland and Bhutan, whose representatives are here with us this morning. So what is a well-being economy? It's about five basic human needs, dignity, nature, connection, fairness and participation. And these needs should form the basis for transforming our economic system so that it delivers both social justice and a healthy planet globally. A well-being economy prioritizes human needs over human wants. It means thinking beyond GDP and wealth just understand in terms of money in our pockets. So instead of trying to heal and patch um, a system that is flawed, we want to construct a new economic system that is just and sustainable from its outset. It's regenerative rather than extractive, and all of those who contribute should benefit, not just a few. So our current system uses ill-designed indicators, GDP being the most famous one, um, which doesn't measure um, the kind of harm we do to ourselves and to the planet. So we need to reframe growth, um, we need to consider what kind of growth, growth in which economic sectors and for whose benefits. So we have um, invited four governments um, from different parts of the world to discuss with them what they are doing to, um, um, for us to be able to thrive within ecological limits. So we have this next uh, 75 minutes to exchange about good policies, good practices, to learn from each other, um, how we can rapidly transform our economic system. So before we go to our distinguished panel, we'll first hear a keynote, um, um, thought-provoking keynote speech, hopefully, from um, Sandrine dixon de Clef. She's a co-president of the Club of Rome. Unfortunately, she's not here with us physically, but she's with us um, online. So, um, Sandrine, the floor is yours. Patricia, thank you so much. I hope you can hear me. Yes, very well. well. <laughs> can you not hear me? We can hear very well. Super, okay. Wonderful. I want to apologize that I can't be with you because I have COVID. And uh, thank you, Patricia, personally for the incredible organization bringing us all together for this very monumental event. Uh, I know that uh, you should be seeing my slides. I just want to make sure that uh, they're on. Not yet. Okay. Technical team. Yes, now here we are. And just uh, let them know when you want to move your slides. Okay, wonderful. Now, for some reason, I cannot see the slides. Um, so it's difficult for me to know which slide is on, actually. Can the technical team show me uh, as well the slides so that I can see? You're sorting it out. Okay, wonderful. Well, let me start in any case, because I know that the time is sacred. 
And let me first say that it's exactly as Patricia indicated, 50 years ago, when Stockholm Plus 50 was also launched, actually Maurice Strong mentioned the importance of the limits to growth. The limits to growth, which was a seminal report, which was actually a report to the Club of Rome, demonstrating very clearly in all of the scenarios that by the 2020s, we would truly be faced with a series of crises. A crisis because actually population growth would have such a serious impact on the use of resources. And that we would start to see that the quality of life factors would go seriously down. And this is why, as Patricia indicated, and so many of us believe, that a new well being economy is absolutely fundamental. Let me just make one point that actually, already in the update of the limits to growth in 2002, it was very clear that the limits authors indicated that this needed to be a revolution that was organic. And so you can go to the next slide, please and show that actually it arises from a series of different visions, from insights, from experiments, from actions of billions of people. And there's not the burden on one particular actor, but that we all have to work together to get credit. This is the way in which we need to contribute together collectively. Next slide, please. And the reason for that as well is because we know we've got interconnected global instabilities and we know that this is incredibly complex and we have to unpack the tensions very clearly between the social system, the economic system, the global commons and the political system. Those tipping points that we are seeing now in terms of the health pandemic, in terms of the climate crisis, and also in terms of conflict, which is right on our doorstep. Those interrelationships need to be understood in terms of how we can truly shift from an economy and a financial system and a political system that does not serve as people, that one that does, and also within the finite planet. Next slide, please. What we have seen in terms of new data is that global well being is truly declining, that actually the differential between wealth in certain areas and not in others means that the average well being index is going straight down in terms of people across the globe. This is the first generation that will make less than its parents and one of the generations that has the highest rate of mental illness and suicide rates. Next slide, please. So what we truly need is a 21st century well-being economic model, one that takes into consideration economic indicators alongside societal indicators and environmental indicators. This is a re-articulation of human development for the 21st century. As one of our prominent Club of Rome members said, we have to redirect purpose from growing GDP to securing the well-being of people and planet. And this is the decisive decade. As we look at our finite planet and look at the planetary boundaries, we need to re-humanize ourselves and bring ourselves back into a role in nature. Next slide, please. So what we have been doing at the Club of Rome, working with also prominent economists from across the globe, is that we know we have gathered enough information, transformational economics are here. We have enough different models and we need to remain agnostic in terms of the specific model we use. Because the most important thing, whether it be well-being economics or mission economies or green growth or post growth or donut economics or beyond GDP theories, is that we have to first account for social and environmental risk in financial and economic decision making. That we then have to expand our perspective of public goods and socialize the rewards of environmental and social commons. And then correct the inequity between high and low income countries created by international finance and trade systems, but also the inequity within economies in the wealthiest parts of the globe and then increase the agency of women and workers to drive the direction of the economy. Next slide, please. This is what has brought scientists and economists together through a large new project called Earth for All that will be released actually in September. The new publication will be, a, I would say, our 50th anniversary edition of the Limits to Growth. And what we've done is we've put together 21st century transformational economics with global and regional systems modeling. This is a systems change agenda for greater well being and planetary boundaries. And what we've seen is that we need at least five key turnarounds poverty, empowerment, equality, and then food and energy. 
We, need, we know that food and energy are our staples. They are what is necessary to keep us healthy and to keep us alive. But we will never be able to transform our food and energy systems and truly shift into a role of living within the finite boundaries without taking into consideration the other three key turnarounds, poverty, empowerment, equality. So let me conclude with the following. And I'm hopeful that we have a little bit of time to show you what I hope will be an inspirational film after I finish. Shifting to a well-being economy is not a luxury. It's a necessity and it is possible. And I would like to finish with a quote from the great Donella Meadows, the principal author of The Limits to Growth and also the queen of systems thinking. Speak the truth, speak it loud and often, calmly but insistently, and speak it as the Quakers say to power. Material accumulation is not the purpose of human existence. All growth is not good. The environment is a necessity, not a luxury. There is such a thing as enough. Thank you very much for hosting this very important meeting. And we look forward to working with all of you to make transformational economics and a well-being economy a reality in the next decade. Thank you. Thank you, Sandrine, for uh, well, setting the scene so well for us. Um, we'll move to our panel. Um, I hope it's okay if I start with you right away. You've just arrived, uh, Virginia Sienkiewicz, uh, Environment Commissioner um, for the European Union. So uh, thanks for being with us uh, in the first place. So um, with the European uh, Green Deal, uh, the European Union has committed to uh, carbon neutrality, to zero pollution by 2050, um, and an economy that works for all. Um, we have just adopted a very ambitious 10-year environmental um, action plan which embraces uh, a well-being economy, um, systemic change and regenerative growth. Um, this is a recognition that we need to um, restore our depleted ecosystems. It's also the first time that such a plan was adopted by all the three European institutions and it's legally binding. So um, what does this concretely mean in terms of moving towards a well-being focused regenerative economy in the EU and beyond globally? Thank you very much and uh, good morning to, 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 to everyone. Um, what's very clear, of course, that we are at the point that there is, uh, there is no time to lose. And the IPCC just warned us uh, very clearly that it is now or never uh, limit global warming to 1.5 degrees, while uh, biodiversity is declining and pollution is also on the race. Uh, so our economic system based on sustainable, uh, unsustainable uh, consumption, uh, especially, you know, uh, use of resources driving all of these triple crises. And in the past two years, under the uh, umbrella of the European Green Deal, we have adopted initiatives such as climate law that you mentioned, which makes the 1.5 uh, degree ambition not only sort of an ambition, a, a, a goal, but legally binding, which is, I think, a, a, a game changer. But most importantly, we also have a very clear uh, plan how to reach the 55% uh, goal at 2030 with the combination of, of, of measures. On top of that, uh, there is a biodiversity strategy, zero pollution action plan, and, and so on. So we're really trying to, to, to address the issue from all over corners with our European Green Deal. Of course, uh, the situation is, is, is very dynamic. When we began our mandate two and a half years ago, uh, I would never probably, you know, believe that we would be operating in this constant crisis mode, where at that time, actually, if, 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 if you remember, with all the uh, Fridays for Future movement, with, with really, you know, s um, gaining the momentum, climate was top of, 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 of the agenda. But then we had a pandemic for two years, and now we have, we have war. And of course, with, with Russia's invasion um, of Ukraine, European history has changed and, 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 and of course helping uh, Ukrainian uh, people is, 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 is now the priority. But at the same time, it would be a historical uh, mistake to allow the war and its consequences to stop the implementation of the European Green Deal, which more and more calls I, 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 I hear around. And 
we have heard some 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 really very similar arguments uh, during the COVID-19, uh, and 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 then we actually at the end of the day discovered that actually Green Deal offered some of the fundamental answers that actually needed to 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 face the challenges, and most importantly with huge amount of public money invested to, to, to build back better. And this is what our citizens want. That's the most important part. That um, conference on uh, the future of Europe uh, have a very, very clear uh, outcome where citizens want us to act on climate issues and wants to do that, uh, that uh, now. And with the eighth environmental uh, action program uh, called Living Well Within Planetary Boundaries, which sets out... Um, a 2050 vision. This is the first time the EU commits to uh, towards a uh, sustainable well-being economy through, most importantly, again, uh, legally binding instrument. Of course, uh, the transitions uh, needed to build a new economic model, they are not easy. And even people who, uh, you know, ask for that change sometimes, I guess they do not even imagine what sort of change it is. And it's extremely important to, of course, keep everyone, everyone on board uh, because we are democracies and, 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 and then the power can shift very quickly and, and not necessarily everyone, as I said, on board as, as regards on, 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 on our Green Deal or objective. Especially, I, I think, after COVID-19, now with the high rates of, 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 of inflation, fragile economic situation, uh, we have really fragile social fabric. So, of course, we need to articulate and put our messages uh, very clearly, but also show that there is a advantages and growth uh, within, within, within our green transition. So, of course, uh, a lot has been said who, 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 pays, uh, who pays the cost of the transition. And I'm thinking, uh, first of all, of, of course, um, example of job losses in fossil fuels, extractive sectors, uh, particularly in some regions, and higher prices for energy, food, transport, housing, uh, and, 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 and so on, uh, which could deepen further, you know, existing inequalities, which we also, you know, have plenty here in Europe. And there is another dimension of inequality, which is yet less known, environmental inequality. So poorer households are much more affected by environmental degradation and climate change. Uh, uh, as they are more likely to live in areas with poorer air quality, less likely to have access to high quality product and then green areas and, and, and so on and are much more vulnerable. And this is even less acceptable when we know that poorer households have a lower environmental footprint. And within the EU, the top 10% of polluters account for almost 30% of the total EU carbon footprint and a great, greater contribution than that of the, the, the bottom 50%. And these stark differences um, in, uh, in, in, in carbon footprints are rooted in the things people, first of all, buy and consume with everyday choices. Because I get this question a lot. So what can I do? Probably as an individual, I cannot do anything. No, it's actually your everyday uh, consumption is the driving uh, uh, force behind, behind what's happening. So this divide is even bigger when we look at the global level where the top 1% account for 16% of, of global greenhouse uh, gas emissions and ambitious, of course, environmental policies, they contribute to decreasing the negative impacts of, of climate uh, change, pollution uh, on poor people especially, and hence environmental protection and the fight uh, against uh, climate change are matters of social justice within Europe, but also, of course, uh, uh, globally. And uh, very clearly that the Gre Green Deal is, is not an island, uh, is, is, is not separated. And uh, from the very beginning, we said that it's our growth strategy. And of course, it has to be interlinked with, with all possible areas, because otherwise that change is not, not going to happen. That's why I think it's extremely important that we talk today about the, 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 the eco economies, uh, about the, the just transition, which we again have a special fund for just transition, social climate fund, uh, and, and, and etc. Uh, but very important also skills agenda. Uh, there is uh, very often that, uh, you know, uh, we have this issue uh, discussing, for example, what's going to happen with coastal communities around, uh, around Europe, where um, they heavily depend on two activities, fisheries and um, tourism. 
And of course, the, both of those activities were heavily hit during uh, especially pandemic, but also were with uh, fuel prices, because the sector is still far from being decarbonized, uh, hit, hit the activities hard. So one of the main issues, I always say that it's a, it's a, it's a reskilling and, and, and skills agenda is going to be, to be, to be crucial with uh, the use of, of, of uh, available, uh, available funds. At the end uh, of, of the day, the, the, the probably one of the last things which I want to mention, because still, you know, we, are, we kind of left the pandemic behind us or we learned how to live with it, but the health is a very important part. And I think very often uh, um, leaders, uh, prime ministers uh, discussing the, 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 the budget, they forget pollution and they leave it out of it, discussing already the consequences of pollution, so the health on, on, on public, public uh, expenditures, on, 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 on medicine, on, on health, which is absolutely wrong, because if we would manage to tackle pollution, the, the line which you have to spend uh, the, the, the public funds on, 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 on health would be, of course, way, way lower. So, just to finalize, you know, uh, I think European Commission uh, and, and European Union is, is, is fully committed. And what's importantly, we've managed to, 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 to put those commitments into legislation, not only goals and, and, and wishes, but into legislation. And despite these really huge uh, changes, the seismic events that, that we, we're witnessing, we find in the end of the day that the, the Green Deal is our answer, which can actually help us go through, through the transition in a just uh, uh, manner, who can actually keep uh, the society, uh, society well together and uh, uh, you know, promote uh, equality and most important, finalize the, the, the project of independence, independence from fossil fuels, independence from, 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 from third countries. And this is what now, of course, been uh, at the center of attention. Thank you. Thank you so much. Well, you, you mentioned uh, well many important points, but um, one thing you said is that uh, it's important to make sure that uh, we bring people along. It must be a just transition, but also people need to kind of um, identify with the transition. They need to be empowered in the transition. And um, we believe that the concept of well-being economy is a very powerful narrative that can actually help to mobilize and to bring people along in that transition. So um, let's now go to um, our other panelists um, who um, have something to tell about very concrete things that they do um, in their country. So I would like to start uh, with uh, Sophie Ho. You're the Future Generations Commissioner for Wales. Um, so Wales has adopted um, a pretty unique piece of legislation, um, the Wellbeing of Future Generations Act. And it gives Wales uh, the ambition, the permission, but also the legal obligation to improve its social, cultural, environmental and economic well-being. And it has attracted a lot of interest from governments around the world. Um, so, um, can you um, share with us what are the key provisions of that act, but also more concretely, how has that changed policy making in Wales, in particular regarding economic system change? Yes, absolutely. It's great to be with you um, this morning. So, um, Wales is um, the first country in the world to have legislated to protect the interests of future generations, and our groundbreaking legislation does um, a number of, of things. I think it brings a number of elements together, which um, often um, emerge in policy discourse as quite separate issues. How do we achieve the sustainable development goals? Um, what about the concept of well-being economics? Um, what about futures and how we're accounting for the needs of future future generations, um, what about the issues around existential threat and so on, and you often, as I said, find those happening in different uh, policy spheres and discourses, but actually our legislation in Wales brings all of those um, elements together. So the overarching principle of our legislation is that it sets out a legal requirement um, on all of our main institutions, so all of our local authorities, our municipalities, our local government, um, our health institutions, our national institutions like our public health agency, our environmental agency, Agency, and significantly the Welsh government and Welsh ministers themselves to demonstrate how when they're taking decisions they are meeting today's needs without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their own needs. Then it sets out seven long-term well-being goals. Now I always say you wouldn't think it was revolutionary for a country to have a set of long-term goals but it's completely revolutionary because the entire political system across the world operates generally on the basis of one electoral term um, to the next which is why we find 
find ourselves in this crisis of, uh, you know, crisis in terms of climate, failure to address intergenerational um, inequity and poverty, failure to plan, I would say, effectively for an ageing population and changing demographics, um, and so on, because we're operating in a sort of, you know, between a three and five year um, perspective. So in Wales, we have not just some aspirational policy documents setting out long term goals, but long term goals set out in law, um, which all of our institutions are required to um, take steps to meet. And those seven well-being goals, I won't go through them um, through them all, but a prosperous Wales, um, a more resilient Wales, which is about ecological resilience, a healthier Wales, a more equal Wales, and so on. And I just want to pick out our definition of a prosperous Wales, which is a productive, innovative, low-carbon society, one which uses resources efficiently and proportionately, including acting on climate change, and one which develops a well-educated population with the skills to enable them to access decent work. Now, okay, not a catchy definition, but if you pull out our legal definition of prosperity in Wales, um, you'll notice the emission of GDP. Um, you'll notice that our definition of prosperity is prosperity within planetary boundaries. Um, you'll no notice that it focuses on skills to enable people to access decent work, not just any old work. And when you combine the legal requirements to take action to meet that goal of prosperity in line with our requirements around ecological resilience, around improving the physical and mental health and well-being of our population, of reducing inequality, of building a Wales of cohesive communities, of building a globally responsible Wales, actually what you can see is that the policy context in Wales is going off in a completely different and I would argue incredibly progressive um, direction. But the Act goes um, further. It also sets out the tools, if you like, for how decisions um, should be taken or the principles by which decisions um, should be taken. Five key principles. Um, public bodies and institutions have to, have to demonstrate how they've considered the long-term impact of the things that they do. They must seek to prevent problems from occurring or from getting worse. Prevention, as we know, much better than, um, than cure. And my, my colleague here making reference to, actually, if we dealt with air pollution um, or dealt with pollution, we would be making significant savings to our healthcare um, bill. That's absolutely the direction that we need to be going in. Integration, so recognising the connections between things. Everything is connected. So when we talk um, about climate justice, climate justice is a racial justice issue. So actually the movement around Black Lives Matters, um, the movement around, you know, how do we account for our emissions in the global north, um, having the biggest impact on the global south who account for much fewer um, emissions, but also even in the global north, if you are from a black Asian minority ethnic community, you're far more likely to be living in areas of high air pollution. You're far less likely to have access to open space. So all of these things are interconnected. And so our legislation requires our policymakers to make those connections um, and work beyond their boundaries and beyond their silos. And that is one of the real game changers in our legislation, and I'll give you some examples of how that's playing out um, in a moment. It also then requires them to collaborate, so to work together, both across the public sector and across public policy, but also with the private sector um, and the voluntary sector. And then it requires our institutions to involve citizens, to co-produce solutions, to take us towards meeting these long-term wellbeing goals um, with, um, with our population, with our citizens. And... The minister who took this legislation through the, um, the Welsh Parliament described that as the Common Sense Act, because I would say that all five of those principles are inherently common sense. What is the problem with public policy is that there's, you know, common sense isn't often that common in the way that we go um, about doing things. Um, it also establishes a commission, a commissioner. I am independent of the government. My job is to hold the government to account on how they're embedding these um, principles. So let me just tell you very quickly about some of the things that have changed. One of the first major tests of this legislation were government proposals to spend the entire of their borrowing capacity on building a 13-mile stretch of motorway to deal with the problem of congestion. Now, this is probably an issue which plays out in countries across the world and where you have a, a, an argument between economy versus environment, which is usually how it plays out, economy generally wins because we'll make economic gains or savings by the time saved, you know, through sitting in 
our cars in congestion. The problem is, is you know, if you're applying a different lens, if you're applying a well-being lens across social, economic, environmental, and cultural well-being across those seven well-being goals, actually building a road is not the solution at all. So my intervention challenged the government. Please explain to me how this is in line with our goal of a prosperous Wales, taking account of that legal definition. How is this in line with our goal of a resilient Wales, which is about ecological resilience because the plans were to go through a nature reserve? Can you explain to me how it's in line with our goal of a healthier Wales when our future trends are showing increasing obesity rates and we need to get people out of their cars, we need to get them travelling actively, we need to reduce our air pollution, which is having a direct impact on our long-term health. Also explain to me how this is in line with our goal of more equal Wales when 25% of the lowest income families in this region do not have access to a car. So why are you spending the entire of your borrowing capacity on a scheme that will only benefit those who are already um, better off? And the First Minister, despite um, a recommendation that should proceed, the First Minister, based on that intervention, cancelled that road. Since then, we have reformed our entire transportation strategy in Wales to put wellbeing metrics um, at the heart of the transport strategy. We have reformed the way in which we spend. So two thirds of our infrastructure investment budget was spent on roads. This year, that has reduced to a third. And Wales has become the first country in the world, I believe, to announce a moratorium on all road building with every pre-approved scheme to be reviewed in light of the Future Generations Act and our wellbeing goals and metrics. There's much more that I could tell you about the reforms to the education system, the reforms to land use planning, the reforms to the way that we're thinking about waste, the fact that Wales is the third best country in the world on recycling and we will become zero waste by 2050. But the underpinning aspects of all of this is that governance for future generations, that governance for well-being and that requirement to think long term and holistically. Thank you so much, Sophie. That was, I think, a very... Yes. A brilliant and very concrete illustration of uh, what a well-being economy can, can look like. So um, I'd like to move to uh, another example. Um, we have with us today uh, Tsering Gjeltsen Penjor. He's the um, um, ambassador of the Kingdom of Bhutan to the EU and uh, countries around the EU. So. Um, Bhutan has seen a very remarkable, uh, a very remarkable development from being a, a very poor country just a few decades ago. You've seen a very clear increase in life expectancy. You've reduced um, poverty. Um, you also have a very ambitious uh, target of um, net zero greenhouse gas emissions and zero waste by 2030 already. Actually, Bhutan is already a carbon sink. You produce more oxygen than um, you consume. And uh, the country's development strategy um, is based on a very unique philosophy uh, around the cross-national happiness, um, the GNH. Can you share some concrete examples of how the, the GNH framework has changed policy-making, decision-making um, in your country and what other parts of the world can eventually learn from that? Thank you, Patricia, and uh, good morning and uh, greetings from uh, the government and His Majesty the King of Bhutan to all our distinguished participants here. Thank you so much for organizing this very, very timely event, uh, uh, Patricia, with you and your, the co-hosts uh, co, uh, co of the event. So if you allow me, uh, I think as you mentioned, uh, uh, you know, we are not a rich country, uh, but allow me to share a very brief uh, context uh, in terms of where we've come from. Uh, today, we greatly appreciate, there's a lot of appreciation for the achievements Bhutan has made, but allow me to share a very, very brief context. We started plan development only in 1961. Uh, this was barely about uh, barely a decade before the World Summit here in uh, Stockholm. Uh, in 1961, we, we literally had no infrastructure. We had no roads, uh, no modern education system, no modern health uh, care system. Uh, we were a butter economy. Uh, our currency, we, the monetization of the eco economy only happened in the 1970s. So that's, uh, that's where we started off from, I think, in 1961, uh, when we started our first uh, planned development. Uh, over the last uh, six decades now, we've, uh, uh, I would say we've had uh, remarkable uh, success. And uh, this has mainly been, of course, uh, through the very far-sighted leadership of our successive monarchs. Uh, we've been guided by the development philosophy of His Majesty the Fourth King, Gross National Happiness. And uh, in this context, allow me to very briefly share the four broad pillars under which uh, the uh, Gross National Happiness Framework has uh, guided Bhutan in its uh, development journey. 
Uh, these four pillars, of course, are not separate. Uh, they're integrated. They mutually reinforce each other. Uh, so pillar, pillar one, no, no, the first uh, pillar, which mainly deals with uh, the conventional socioeconomic development, uh, GDP, uh, that's something that uh, you know, every country has to have, so Bhutan is no exception. We are not just about happiness. Uh, but what we do, of course, uh, emphasize in our socio-economic uh, development approach is one is equity and second is sustainability. So these are two very important uh, uh, elements that we, uh, you know, we incorporate in all, our plan, uh, in all our plans and policies. Here in terms of achievement, as I mentioned, we started off from scratch. And uh, we have uh, today, uh, we've, uh, one of the priorities we've always provided for is to the health and education sector, especially primary health and primary, uh, primary education. And thanks to this uh, enlightened policy, we have today a very robust health and education system. Uh, number two, our focus on equity. We've always, uh, we, have, we actually have a living standards survey conducted uh, periodically. Uh, we really take our Gini coefficients seriously. And uh, these very much inform uh, our plans and policies to ensure that uh, you know, uh, development is equitable. Uh, in terms of uh, GDP growth, we have had, uh, I would say, uh, very good success. Uh, GDP growth, the real GDP growth in Bhutan since the 1980s has averaged about 7.5%. However, we've uh, given our, the other pillar, which I'll get to later, the environmental uh, pillar, we've ensured that uh, growth has not come at the cost of our uh, environment. A testimony of uh, our success in the socio-economic sector is uh, we will be graduating from the least developing country status in 2023. So it's uh, happy to be joining uh, the so-called middle-income countries, uh, but uh, this is just a testimony of uh, the success we've had on the socio-economic front. Uh, in terms of poverty, for example, uh, we have what we call is uh, targeted poverty reduction strategies. We are fortunate. Our country is just a population of 650,000 people. So perhaps uh, size matters, and in that sense, maybe it's easier for Bhutan to have a very targeted approach. Uh, through these uh, very targeted policies, we've been managed to reduce poverty from 32% uh, to 10.2% uh, to, uh, uh, in, uh, in, 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 in a decade. So this is something that uh, we take uh, great pride in, and this as I mentioned uh, earlier, the, uh, the emphasis we give to uh, equitable development or equitable economic growth. Uh, with regard to the uh, second pillar, I'll not dwell too much on it, but it's uh, important. It's the preservation of our cultural heritage, our traditional values. Uh, in many ways, it's these, uh, the, the traditional values. Uh, we are a Buddhist society mainly. Uh, it's uh, mainly this uh, value system that actually uh, has ensured that we have a very strong policy on the environment side. But uh, even culture and uh, our cultural heritage is a very important component in our, in our planning process. And uh, this has allowed us in one way, as a small country, we have to embrace globalization. So we have embraced globalization, but without losing uh, what, is, uh, what is important for us, our own living cultural uh, heritage, as well as our value systems. So this is another key pillar that uh, uh, is under the gross national happiness framework. Uh, the third pillar, which of course is very relevant to our summit here today, is the preservation of the environment or conservation of uh, the environment. Now, this is an area, of course, Bhutan has uh, gained uh, increased uh, a lot of recognition for. Uh, we are we are not a resource-rich country, but I think we have made significant contributions. I think uh, to the fight against uh, climate change. Uh, we are perhaps one of the countries that has the most stringent, for example, environmental impact assessment policies. For any uh, industry that comes up, there's a very, very stringent uh, you know, EIA uh, framework in place. And I can share examples. For example, uh, we, uh, the government could not build a road because uh, it affected the Tiger Sanctuary. Uh, we, uh, some mining, uh, mining companies were shut down because it was polluting, uh, you know, uh, the, uh, the, uh, there was air pollution for the community close by. Uh, we don't allow mountaineering in Bhutan. It could bring us a lot of money, open up our mountains, but we believe our mountains to be sacred. But more importantly, mountains, the glaciers feed our, our, our rivers, uh, which, and our rivers, uh, you know, uh, provide hydro, hydropower for us. So these are, these are just some examples of, uh, you know, uh, the practical sort of application of our uh, the environmental uh, uh, policies under the GNH. Uh, on, on, a, on a broader scale, and in terms of our contribution to fight climate change, I mean, in 1972, we had the Stockholm uh, conference here. Barely two years after the Stockholm conference, 
uh, Bhutan actually we adopted our national forest policy and uh, the forest policy required government to keep uh, maintain 60% of our land under forest cover for all times and this was way back in 1974 uh, this of course today is enshrined in article 5 of our constitution so governments whether they want whether they like it or not they have to maintain 60% of our land under forest cover uh, in reality, of course, we've even surpassed that commitment. We are 72.5% under forest cover. And as you were mentioning, uh, Patricia, we, this has allowed us to be, I think, an invaluable carbon sink uh, for the world. Uh, we sequester, I understand, uh, three times more carbon emissions than we uh, uh, emit. So this is just a small, uh, in a small way, contribution to fight uh, climate change. Uh, if I may now just very briefly, of course, also share the fourth pillar, which uh, is in some ways the key, uh, is good governance. Uh, you know, we've always focused on good governance. Uh, way back from the 1950s, under the, uh, starting from the third king, through our successive monarchs, Bhutan has gradually transitioned into a democracy. Uh, today, uh, in 2008, we adopted our constitution. Uh, since then, we've had uh, three elections and three different governments. The Bhutanese seem to have a penchant to change governments, so I'm not sure whether that is good or not, but uh, uh, that, that, that's in some ways, I guess, uh, you know, a reflection of the success of democracy in Bhutan. Uh, for example, voter turnout. Uh, we, I was just going through very recently trying to understand our voter turnout. Bhutan is probably one of, among the highest countries in terms of voter turnout. We've averaged 72% voter turnout uh, in Bhutan over the last three elections. Uh, more importantly, again, uh, in democracy, uh, it's, uh, the grassroots are so important. We've always uh, consistently, I think since the 1980s, uh, focused on decentralization on local governments. Uh, and uh, with the uh, strengthening of local governments, more importantly, strengthening of an independent and strong media and civil societies, today we find democracies not just at the macro level, but democracy is actually being strengthened right down to the grassroots. So this, we feel, is uh, really a vital element in terms of good governance because without good governance, none of the other three pillars would be possible. So. Uh, Given that we've started from 1961, uh, we do take great pride in our achievements. And, uh, uh, but uh, you know, as a small country, as I mentioned, population of less than 650,000 people, uh, Bhutan is not uh, the sort of romanticized uh, Shangri-La that uh, you may read in the media. We have our share of hardships. We have our share of problems. Uh, as I mentioned, a small country, uh, and it's a rapidly changing world. So there are challenges, and uh, for us, uh, it's, it's very imperative for a small country to keep on taking stock of where we are, where we are going. And uh, today we find ourselves uh, uh, you know, in the midst of very rapid uh, change in the world, I mean, in all aspects of our lives, uh, mainly because of uh, the I mean, amazing advancements in technology and globalization. So this is something that we, uh, uh, we in Bhutan are taking stock of. Uh, where, where do we fit in this new 21st century? And uh, here, very broadly, uh, you know, in the interest of time, allow me to share two uh, key priorities that we see in going ahead. Uh, one is, of course, the uh, transformation of our uh, education sector. Uh, today, we have a very young population, 60% below the age of uh, 25. So uh, that's, uh, uh, that's a very important uh, sort of constituency uh, in terms of government policy. So transformation of our education sector is a very high priority for Bhutan now. We've, done very well in providing basic education, primary education, secondary education. But uh, for, the, for the 21st century economy, I think education has to be at a very different level. And uh, as a small country, we recognize that. And uh, this is uh, going to be a, a highest priority, I think, for the co coming decades. Uh, related to education, uh, it's also now the need to diversify our economy. Uh, we are, as I mentioned, we are graduating from the least developed country. Uh, we will have to now sustain our development on our own without development assistance. So we have to find ways to generate revenue. So what do we do? So in that context, uh, we, of course, uh, we are now uh, embracing uh, the need to diversify the economy. Uh, but here again, uh, we are giving a strong emphasis to the values of GNH. So we see we need to diversify the economy, but the economy needs to be green. We need to transition into a green economy. So here we are here with you, uh, with the EU on this. We also uh, we also seek to transition to a green economy. Uh, we also look. Uh, we are now actually opening up our country to foreign direct investments. This was something that we used to be very skeptical about, but now we see the need uh, for investments into Bhutan. But here again, we are looking for ethical investments, and uh, there are I think many uh, companies out there. 
that uh, view investments, uh, I think, uh, uh, that have uh, very similar principles as we have in terms of GNH, and so we, are, uh, we seek similar investments in Bhutan, investments that are green, investments that are uh, ethical. Uh, lastly, if I may conclude, uh, we know we will continue to face challenges. I mean, it's, it's a rapidly changing world. Uh, for us, uh, uh, as far as uh, we see, uh, you know, we have to pursue uh, economic growth in the sense of trying to you know, improve the welfare of our citizens, both current and future generations. However, we do very strongly believe that the underlying philosophy, the underlying uh, values of GNH will always remain relevant for us. And here, if I may, uh, allow me to conclude by paraphrasing uh, some of the thoughts of His Majesty the King, uh, when he says that uh, GNH for us in Bhutan, uh, it serves as a bridge between the fundamental values of uh, kindness, equality and humanity, and the necessary pursuit of uh, economic growth. Uh, GNH acts as our national conscience, guiding us towards making wiser decisions for the future. Uh, it, ins it ensures no matter what the nation may seek to strive to achieve, the human dimension and the individual's place in the nation is never forgotten. It is a constant reminder that we must strive for a caring leadership so that as the world and the country changes, as our nation's goals change, our foremost priority will always remain the happiness and well-being of our people, including the generations to come. So thank you so much and uh, Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Getson, for sharing some insights into how you um, ensured quite uh, impressive social economic development for the country without compromising um, on the health of, uh, well, people and, and nature. So we'll move to our last uh, government representative. We also have with us uh, Terry Letonen. She's a state secretary in the Finnish Ministry for the Environment. And while well, the Finnish government a couple of years ago, and we were actually there, uh, organized um, a post-growth conference in 2019, um, which put forward a, a set of recommendations for well -being, a well-being economy, and that really helped to, to put the, the, the concept on the agenda, at least uh, in, in across Europe. And uh, early last year, the Ministry of Social Affairs and Health started to prepare a, a national action plan to um, integrate the economy of well-being approach into decision-making. Uh, Finland also joined the Wellbeing Economy Government Alliance. Well, uh, Wales is uh, also part of that alliance. So, um, how are you working um, in, in the Environment Ministry to integrate ecological well-being into the economy of well-being approach? And can you also share some concrete examples of how that has changed policy making in, in Finland? Sure. Thank you. And 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 ladies and gentlemen, fr dear friends, um, it is a great pre pleasure to to participate today in this in this side event on the well-being economies. And I would like to thank the organizers and all, all contributors to uh, this very interesting meeting. To us, the economy of well-being is about the interlinkages between the economy and the well-being of people and the planet. Uh, the, the approach is to understand that the economy must serve well-being and respect the planetary boundaries. This is something that Finland has given a lot of thought during the past years. Um, as you mentioned, Finland put the concept forward uh, in council conclusions during our EU presidency in 2019, and we have continued to the discussion at national, EU and, and global levels thereafter. Our national steering group on the economy of well-being is developing an action plan to support the implementation. In addition, we're actively working with, with the EU, the UN organizations, the OECD, and the well-being governments uh, network on this issue. The economy of well-being places well-being at the heart of all political decision-making and highlights the role of investments in well-being. Political decisions at all levels should be knowledge-based and supporting, supported by impact assessments, um, like was already mentioned by the colleague. Uh, the economy of well-being challenges are knowledge-based. We need to develop well-founded frameworks to mon monitor data on the development of well-being uh, and the economy, as well as the state of the environment. We need to develop our decision-making and monitoring processes as we work on social, economic and ecological aspects simultaneously. It is timely to enhance discussion about a more comprehensive approach to well-being for human and planet and economy. Dear friends, the economy of well-being is also about collaboration between decision-makers, administration, civil society, academia and the private sector. 
We can all benefit from discussion that brings together different perspectives. We, we believe that applying the economy of well-being approaches promotes sustainable economic, social and ecological development. Today's events and discussions brings us cl closer to this goal. The UN Agenda 2030 and its Sustainable Development Goals form the important framework for global development and, and the basis for Finland's government program. Already in early 2000, the spreading of new viral diseases and threats led to the development of concept of One Health, a holistic approach to the, of the collaboration between human and animal health and the protection of ecosystems. This approach is crucial to promote safe planet and full, to fulfill the SDGs. We have seen how the COVID-19 pandemic has made apparent the interlinkages between health, well-being, uh, biodiversity and economy. It has also highlighted the importance of the promotion of health and well-being through, throughout different policy areas, bringing also one health approach closer to, to practice. Finland continu continues to pursue one health approach in all policies, including, for example, in our national multi-sectoral work against antimicrobial resistance and tackling the use and overuse of antibiotics. Climate change, declining biodiversity, pollution and overconsumption of natural resources are among the most critical issues facing humanity. Finland welcomes the recent pu recently published UN Environment Assembly Resolution on Biodiversity and Health and encourages continued collaboration among the CBG, the WHO, the OEA, uh, FAO, UNEF and other biodiversity related conventions. The transition to a greener future must be just and inclusive. inclusive. Solving the sustainability crisis will require prompt systemic changes in our societies. Now, Finland aims to be the uh, world's first fossil-free welfare state. We have set our target to be uh, climate neutral by 2035, not yet like Bhutan, uh, and climate positive thereafter in law. We want to make sure that climate policies and measures are fair, also from social perspective. The transition must be just and inclusive, and it needs to be fair to all population groups. Along with social and gender equality and improving access to social and health services, we feel mental uh, health as an essential element in the economy of well-being. Our national parks and network of protected areas provide easy access to nature and have been critical to support the uh, critical support to mental health and well-being also during the COVID pandemic. An economy of well-being is committed to a healthy planet and people, and we strongly believe that through that lens, we can build a better future. Thank you. Thank you, Tilly. So thank you so much to our four government representatives. The commissioner had to leave. Um, well, now we also want to hear from um, our friends and allies from civil society groups from around the world. So we have invited um, five representatives from different world regions, from different constituencies, to also share with us um, what their priorities uh, for the transformation towards well-being economy economies in different contexts in different regions are. So we'll start with two colleagues who are here with us in the room before we uh, go to those who are joining us remotely. So I'll first invite uh, Jennifer Del Rosario Malonso from the Philippines. Um, she is the executive director of Ebon International, a global NGO network um, working with social movements, especially in the global south and with marginalized groups. Jennifer. Is it on? Thank you very much, Patricia, and uh, thank you so much to all our uh, panelists who have shared their efforts in pursuing well-being economies. Um, and good morning to everyone here in the room. Um, well-being economy presents an important track in pursuing an alternative development for the South. Um, we feel that it is also a promising alternative to this very single-minded pursuit of development. Uh, of growth, no? often uh, resulting in inequalities, um, in uh, declining well-being, as pointed out by our uh, keynote speaker earlier, and also um, development aggression against uh, vulnerable communities in the South, especially women, and also adversely uh, impacting our um, ecological systems, such as due to pollution, pointed out by our speaker from the European Commission. And um, 
also encroaching you know, on uh, indigenous people's ancestral domain. Um, national industrialization for the global south um, does not need to take the carbon intensive path that you know, developed countries pursued. Um, however, uh, you know, phasing out fossil fuels um, in our de uh, developing countries um, must also be done in an equitable manner. Equity is key, as pointed out by our um, esteemed speaker from Bhutan, and must not compromise our national industrialization as well as our right to development. For development to be truly sustainable and promote well-being for the people and planet, it has to highlight the centrality of people's rights and sovereignty, promote uh, local community-driven sustainability practices, and indigenous ways of resource management, and also demand accountability, as pointed out by our speaker from Wales, accountability from governments as well as from corporations for any uh, inimical policies or harmful corporate practices. Emphasis must also be made on community-driven and people-powered sustainable consumption and production. Um, this uh, should instead be uh, done uh, instead of big-ticket infrastructure, infrastructure and uh, the pursuit of growth um, that do not consider other dimensions of human and planetary well-being. And um, as an example, I would like to uh, point out, for example, for smallholder farmers in the Philippines who are asserting their rights to land are at the same time pursuing um, agroecology and seed saving, for instance, to demonstrate um, that these are practical alternatives to the dominant corporate-driven agriculture and also to challenge the patent monopoly of seeds. So to conclude, I highlight again people-powered sustainable consumption and production that is um, something that even International is working on with uh, uh, the Swedish Society for Nature Conservation. And um, I highlight the principles of, uh, such as people's rights and of course repression and human rights abuses obviously have no place <laughs> in, in a well-being economy. Um, and in the pursuit of sustainable consumption and production. Um, second, uh, the principle of self-sufficiency and people's sovereignty. Um, and third, support for social innovations, um, community practices, um, community actions for sustainable consumption and production that have long been uh, done no, by our uh, grassroots communities and, uh, indi and uh, indigenous peoples. And lastly, the very important principle of accountability from governments and corporations. So all of these principles we feel would be contributory to help achieve the transformation for well-being that we want, not just for our people, but also for our planet. Thank you very much. Thanks, thanks, Jennifer. So from... Um, East Asia, we're moving to South America. We have with us uh, Nina Gualinga from Ecuador. Nina is an environmental and indigenous rights activist from the Quechua community. She's been advocating for better environmental protection of the Ecuadorian Amazon, its wildlife, and the people who depend on it. Nina, the floor is yours. Thank you. Um, thank you, everyone, for inviting me here. Um, I will share a perspective from indigenous people in the Amazon, but I think that this perspective we share across the world as indigenous people that live in a close relationship and connection to the land. Um, and when we talk about well-being and economy, um, across the world, um, in the name of well-being and economy, progress and development, indigenous people have been displaced, our lands have been taken away from us, exploited, we have been marginalized and violated. Um, 
in the Amazon, where I come from, it happens through oil extraction, fossil fuel extraction, it happens through mining, logging, um, road building, and I also think it's really important to acknowledge since we are in Sweden, where there are indigenous people, and northern Sweden, Sápmi, is indigenous Sami ancestral lands, and in the name of green mining and well-being, um, indigenous Sami people are being displaced, their rights are being violated, and they're being disrespected as indigenous peoples. And I think it's, um, it's <laughs> disturbing that we can put a word like green in front of mining to justify those violations. That is not a well-being economy. Not for the indigenous people, and we are humans as well. We have rights. And we also have our own ways of defining economy and well-being and progress and development. And I want to share that with you today. What does development mean for my people, for the Quechua people of Sarayaco? What does well-being and progress mean? For us, it's fertile soil, healthy land, it's clean water, clean air, water that you can drink directly from the streams, soil where you can grow your own food, it's abundance in the forest and in the rivers, and it's about solidarity of your community and your people. So when we speak about well-being and economy, let's not forget about that because we have lived that way and there are people that continue living with a different definition of well-being, development and progress and economy. And the definition of all these things in the global world has taken us to the point where we are desperately looking for solutions because we are realizing that we did something wrong. So let's learn from indigenous people, learn from those who hold that knowledge of living in close relationship, respect, and balance with the land. And here in Sweden, it means also learning and respecting the Sami indigenous people. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Nina, for this very important intervention. And uh, I believe the economic system that we dream of is one which is based on truly respecting human rights, especially the rights of indigenous people and, and land rights, and also valuing local and, and indigenous knowledge. So thank you very much for, for joining us and sharing with us. We have three more colleagues who are online. Um, we have uh, Georgina Munoz. She's uh, co-chair of the Global Call for Action Against Poverty, based in Nicaragua, Nicaragua where she's working on social and economic justice. Um, she's speaking in Spanish, but we have an interpreter, so I hope that the technicalities are working out. Georgina, the floor is yours. Tiene la palabra. Sí. Buenos días a todos y todas. Eh, un saludo desde Latinoamérica y Nicaragua. Como parte del GICAP y como parte de Latina, vamos a compartir con, con ustedes las visiones que tienen nuestros pueblos sobre las transformaciones económicas que parten de nuevas economías transformadoras. In order to implement economies of well-being for life and the planet, we require that societies, civil society organizations, territories and governments start from a social and political dialogue that prioritizes the political will of decision makers and those who have the economic resources. In the framework of Stockholm Plus 50 and the Escazo Agreement, we propose that development processes should be endogenous from the cosmovision 
and imaginaries in the life of the peoples. Their public policies should be based on the true care of their ecosystems and without technique taking away the access of indigenous populations to their environment that they have historically preserved. For a true sustainable development, financing is urgent. Allocating funds to achieve the objectives forced him for human welfare. And in turn, it is necessary that the government to mobilize internal resources, giving priority to the population, to the territory, to make good use of the resources of the territory and that it returns to the welfare of its inhabitants. We consider that the alternative transforming economies are in the field of proposals. It's a critic to the dominant model it is a critic to the current development model, which comes from the people stand before those who have the power. But not doing a redistribution of richness. This is added to the recognition of the traditional knowledge. Transformative economies are centered on the search for the dignity of people and the care of nature. And they are paradigms that has to do the transformative economies that come from the world of social and the tradition of the cooperative world from feminist proposals of which we highlight the economy of care and also the fight against climate change. They come from the interest of equality against world hunger, such as full sovereignty and security from the indigenous peoples and their wisdom such as the good living. We agree with the speakers and in face of the question of how to make transformative economies effective, we propose to start from the communities and their relationships. They are built with the people because they are not individualistic economies. Transformative economies are based on community, cooperation, and trust. They are processes that come from within, from the potential of the people, from their historical knowledge. The challenge is to change the culture in the face of the economy. And here, the governments have something to do. There are no human rights, environmental rights, people rights, if there are no rights seen as an emancipatory and vindicating horizon, horizon that can become a reality. There are no social movements that can make them a reality to live in peace with the planet while maintaining the integrality of the environment. From Latin America, we demand change in the productive matrix. Considering the challenges imposed on us by the sustainability of life on the planet. Deep transformations in the economy from a feminist perspective. Rights of nature and climate justice for a sustainable future. Food security and food sovereignty as collective rights. We propose to implement transformative economic alternatives linked to the knowledge of the peoples of Latin America and their historical project by expanding the implementation of transformative economies, 
such as care economies, which are fundamental in the relation with people, ecological economy, social solidarity economy, fair trade, and diverse perceptions of transformative economies. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Georgina. And thanks for all your efforts joining us from a very different time zone and despite across linguistic borders. Thank you very much. Um, all the best to Nicaragua. We have two more speakers online. Um, we are very close to the end of our event. So um, please stick very strictly to your three minutes. Otherwise, we'll have to cut you off. Um, so we'll quickly go to Ibrim Sal from The Gambia, who's working on democratic governance, development and prosperity across Africa. Ibrim uh, welcome, and please stick your three minutes so we can wrap up on time. The floor is yours. Can't hear me yet. No, I can't. <laughs> Ibrima, Ibrima, we can't hear you. No. Maybe we can go to our next speaker and see if you can um, speak in a, in a minute. So I'll, I'll ask Bruno to come in and maybe we can still fix that. So we also have Bruno uh, Rulans uh, online. He's the Secretary General of the International Cooperative Alliance, um, an international nonprofit advancing the cooperative model. And we wanted to hear from him how the cooperative model relates to, to well-being economy. Bruno. Can you hear me? Can you yes, hear me? Please. Yes. Okay. So um, I wanted to say that the well-being economy concept, which is reflected uh, here, uh, it, it reflects widely the logic through which the cooperative movement operates. Among other things, the cooperatives have contributed to climate change adaptation in many ways, like agricultural cooperatives carrying out diversification of crops, but also towards mitigation. Uh, with renewable energy cooperatives, agroforestry cooperatives, and so on. So the cooperatives' wide-ranging membership, we're talking about 10%, over 10% of humanity, places them in, uh, in a unique position to raise members' awareness on the environmental issues. The cooperatives, they function according to global standards that they have elaborated among themselves and which have then been enshrined in UN texts and uh, with a logic based on members' needs and aspirations and a structure based on democratic control. They have economic and social objectives which are geared towards the development of the community as a whole. They represent a model of development that links them directly to the environment and related domains. So the cooperative approach has effective tools to improve the social economic conditions of people and for combating one of the primary factors causing the degradation of the environment, which is poverty. The cooperatives generate equality in income and massive employment. They represent over 10% of the world's employed population. In both rural and, uh, and urban areas, they create value chains. They vitalize local markets, include marginalized people groups into uh, the production system. They participate in the entrepreneurial uh, management of the community and the channel people's needs, including in the rising environmental ones. All that provides millions of people with real means of substantially improving their social economic conditions and participate in the gradual building of a sustainable model. So what do we need from policymakers? Three things. So the cooperative movement must be included in the formulation of solutions. And in practice, uh, we can contribute to the following needs. First of all, local management, democratic member control in cooperative structures allows the community to retain control over decisions and their potential impact. It involves the local community in the management of its environmental resources. Second, environmental education. Training in environmental conservation has so far always been lacking in training programs. And in this regard, it's pertinent to realize the significance of the fifth cooperative principle as part of the cooperative standards, which is education, training, and information. Three, local experience and knowledge. The democratic structure of cooperatives and their concern for the community mean that they absorb local traditional know-how on use and care of the environment, including indigenous people, as guided by the cooperative principle seven, which states that cooperatives work for the sustainable development of their communities. So the cooperative movement is a sustainable entrepreneurial model 
and governments should strongly and explicitly promote it by providing an appropriate legal and policy framework. And so this is a call to strongly and explicitly promote the cooperative approach as a model for development that is not only inherently sustainable, but also has the means to deliver. And we hope that the incoming post-COVID period will be an appropriate opportunity to do that. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Bruno. Um, sharing some insights from an alternative economic structure and model, the cooperative model. So I'm sorry for Ibrima that we couldn't take you, but we have come to the end, um, nearly the end of our side event. Um, I hope that you can use the time here to, to network. I know there's a lot of people in the room who work on well-being economies, are very interested, so please talk to each other. I'm sorry we don't have the time to really discuss. Uh, the side events are really short. So I'll just invite um, Johanna Santal, uh, the president of the European Environmental Bureau and the Swedish Society for Nature Conservation, to wrap up our event um, and close. Thank you, Patricia, and thank you everyone here in the room and everyone online for participating in this very important seminar. I realize I only have about two seconds to wrap up, so I am very happy for this, and I, this was very successful, I think. Very much thanks to our excellent panelists from all over the world. Thank you very much for participating here. And you are all very important pioneers uh, in this, perhaps the most important endeavor of the 21st century to establish an economy that delivers well-being to all within the thriving ecosystems of the earth. And I'm very much looking forward to the work that needs to happen, I'm sure it will happen, because we need a shift, that's for sure. So thank you very much, and I'm sure you're all very much interested in knowing more about, about the well-being economy, and what we have here is a recent report from the WWF and the EB that will explain much more where we go from the fact that we need to shift to the how. Thank you very much.